Hello, this is Bruce Stein. I've been a patent attorney for over 30 years. And this is Patent Law 101 for Inventors and Scientists. And this is Part 3. In Part 3, we'll be talking about not losing patent rights. And it divides into two sections. The first is not losing patent rights legally. In other words, things that if you do by nature of law or operation of law, you have lost your patent rights. And the second is not a, from a matter of law, but just a practical matter that if your claims are not worded correctly, uh, competitors will be able to work, legally work around your claims, use your invention, and not infringe. This is part A, how not to lose your patent rights, meaning if you do these items by operation of law, you will have lost your patent. So before you file a provisional patent application, do not one, use the invention commercially more than one year. Two, do not offer it for sale. That puts it on sale. And three, do not make the invention public. Because if you do make it public, it will no longer be novel, and therefore you will not be able to file your patent application. And the ways that most individuals uh, make inventions public is by oral presentations, uh, printed or written publications, or talking to various uh, parties of the public, including venture capitalists. Now, it's absolutely fine to talk to venture capitalists uh, before you file your provisional about obtaining funds and other things that you may need or want to get into business. However, you could, must do so under what's called a confidential disclosure agreement. If you do that, then your invention, even though you've talked to people of the public, if it's done under a CDA, it will, as a matter of law, not have been made public. In this section, we will be discussing how not to obtain worthless claims. Uh, the way to do that is to have a third party review your claims before you file. Many of us in the patent law business work on both sides of the fence. Uh, most of us file and prosecute patent applications to obtain patents for our clients. Many of us also work on the other side of the fence, where our client will find a patent by a competitor uh, want to use the invention, but not want to infringe. And what they ask us to do is to look at the uh, claims and see, in working with the scientists, is there a way where they can use the invention, but not step within the boundaries of the claims. And what I'm suggesting is that that type of review take place uh, before you file your application so that if it's not worded exactly correctly, you can correct it and make it broad and strong. And the reason why I suggest a third party doing it is much easier to find errors when you proofread somebody else's work. And the reason why, you're too close to your own work. And you'll read over uh, errors. You'll read over things that others will pick up as far as a mistake or a possible way to work around something. Uh, and that is why you need third parties to review your claims before you file. The problem is, if an independent claim is not worded correctly to both. First, cover the technology that is actually being commercialized. And second, broad enough to exclude the competition from using similar aspects of the invention, you will not be able to exclude your competition from using your invention. As you may recall from part one, the rights granted to the patentee or assignee is the right to exclude others, not necessarily the right to use the invention. And patentees obtain patents so that they're able to exclude others, meaning their competition, from using the invention. And therefore, you must have the claim worded properly so that you can obtain that goal. To show you what I mean by examining the claims carefully as far as their wording to exclude competition, I'm going to go through a couple of examples for you. The first is a three-step process, where a chemical process where A and B are stirred together to produce an intermediate C. Step two, they isolate and purify the intermediate C. And then in the third step, reacts C with D at a temperature between 30 and 50 to produce the product E. Now, if this claim were brought to me on the other side saying, hey, we like the process, how do we work around this? There are a number of things that I would have said to try. First, instead of stirring A and B, I would mix A and B. I'd put them together, not stir them, but maybe bubble 
an inert gas through, so that they're mixed. Uh, another way would be to omit step two. In other words, don't isolate and purify C, but react it in situ. Once it's produced, then add D and react it in situ. The issue would be whether or not the yield is substantially reduced. If it's not, uh, I would pay to do that. Part of it would be depend on the cost savings of uh, adding step two versus the cost of a license. And the other would be in step three, probably to try and move outside of the range of either below 30 or above 50 degrees so there'd be no literal infringement of the claim. The process that we had on the previous slide was three steps. The way it, I think it should be worded to avoid the issues that I brought up about the uh, mixing and stirring and so on would be to replace them by a word like contacting, which is broad enough to include both stirring and mixing, and also to claim it as a two-step process. Whether one uses the two steps here or whether one isolates and purifies the intermediate C in three steps, either one will be doing this and would infringe the process I have here. And what I would do is make the uh, step that was before in, the, in step two, I'd put it in, in a dependent claim here, uh, which is claim two. Uh, this is a way to broaden the claim and make it much more difficult for a competitor to try and use the invention and work around uh, what you have. And it's an example of a poorly, weighted, uh, poorly worded claim. Here's another example of a claim that has problems. If the patentee has a successful product D and comes up with a new and improved process to make it, which is three steps, A to B, B to C, C to D, and then claims the new improved process as a three-step process, uh, we will then have this as a claim, and I will show you the problems with it on the next slide. Now, if I found a three-step claim such as we had on the previous slide, the way to steal the invention and work around it is as follows. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see we have step one, two, three, transforming A to produce D. One way that I would try and steal it would be if we could find some other starting material X and by step four, produce B. And if we use step four, step two, step three, we will not infringe a claim that reads steps one, two, and three. Uh, similarly, if there's another product out there, not D, but something similar that will do the same as D does, that we will call F, I might use steps one, two, five, and six to produce F and then sell F in competition with D and use the process or use two steps of the process to make F. Uh, a third way would probably be to produce, if there is no X in step four, is to go A, B, C, and then sell C. And there, I'm sure there are other parties out there on the market that would realize that C could be transformed to D by step three, and then would purchase C and transform it to step D. Now, neither myself, which did steps one and two, or another third party, which ran step three, would be doing steps one, two, and three of the claim, and neither of us would infringe, and yet we would be able to, or I wouldn't, but whoever ran the step three would be able to sell D. But in any event, the S and E of the patent that had steps one, two, and three would have another third party working around it. So again, this is a claim that was poorly worded the problems that I showed in the previous examples of working around claims is not just theoretical or, or something that's a rare occurrence, and that's why I put it here. Too often, inventors and patentees spend time and money and effort doing their research, producing a product, getting a patent, and then find others are working around the patent using their invention. And it's all because they didn't word the claims properly. And I see this all too often in my practice. Therefore, to reduce those errors, I recommend that you have an experienced scientist or a patent attorney, either one, who is new to the invention. The critical part here is that they be new to the invention. So they look at it from the other side without any reading over stuff that they've had before. And the question you have to ask them is, can the reviewer find a way to use the invention by working around the claims 
and avoid infringement. If they can work around the claim language and use the invention, then you need to broaden the language to include what they did. And then have them go back and ask the question again. Is there a way to still work around the invention with the new language? If you get to the point where they say they cannot find a way to work around it, uh, every which way is covered under the claim language, then you're done. I hope this is of help to all of you. I hope the previous information that I've set forth here is helpful to all of you, and best of luck.